Timmy the Brit? I came home about 45, 46 years ago and not long after started the Cock Hope Club, which is out in Douglas GA. And um, there's a piper playing there one night called Orna Rivy, a friend of mine to this day, and um, a fabulous piper, and the most unostentatious man you could meet. Very droll, very funny man. But his Boran player was on the on the jail that night and of course wasn't able to play. Now, all I knew that I played the ball line, but he only knew me as Timmy. And when he dawned on him that he had no ball arm player, he said, is Timmy, is, is Timmy the Brit out there? And it stuck. Timmy McCarthy, better known as Timmy the Brit, was born in London to Irish parents in the mid-1940s. As a young boy, Timmy would come home to Cork with his parents a couple of times a year. Tell me about coming up in London as a young boy. Well, we lived in an Irish community and music was a normal part of, uh, at that time, the gramophones and the radio. And uh, all music in my house really was Irish music. And um, my grandfather, Timmy, who I'm named after, was an Irish champion step dancer. What year? I couldn't tell you. But um, my mother's obviously wanted me to emulate my grandfather, and she made me go step dancing. Now, the way things turned out was different, but I actually hated it. I swear, she did me psychological damage, which still, which is affecting me to this day, because I couldn't equate the kilt with the, to me, a kilt was a dress like, and that was obligatory to wear a dress. And you were standing up on stage dancing, you know? And you think people be looking up your kid. Wasn't nice at all. But that was a child at the time, I didn't know about that. Yeah, my mother died when I was eight on November the 5th. And um, we were taken care by the London County Council. My aunt initially, uh, aunt in law, if you like, married my dad's brother. She took us over and then we were sent to an orphanage in um, Nymphfield in Gloucester. Lovely people. Maris nuns, and then um, on secondary school I went with the Blaze, into Blaisden Hall under the Salesian Brothers. And I'd like to say at this particular point, though I'm far from being a religious person, um, those people were honest and genuine and pious and loving people. And I've visited them often um, since. They gave us the very best they could and they, there was none of this horrible stuff that's being reported. I could, I've gone only love and respect for them. They were fabulous people, and they got the best out of me academically and athletically. Fabulous people. I'd like to put that on record anyway. I decided to come back to Ireland for many reasons. One, it was my home. My name is McCarthy. My people were from Cork. And Munster is the home of the McCarthys, and. Um, Funny enough, one of the things that tipped the balance for me was reading three books by Walter Macken, Seek the Fairland Asylum People in the Scorching Wind. And it gave me this kind of dream to go for. And um, I wanted to get back to my roots because I remember as a child, my mother and father always spoke uh, lovingly and of the loneliness of not being home. And um, of course, because they were coming across three or four times a year, bringing me across, they'd have the same homesickness that I would have, you know. What was the, the, the music and the dance scene like when you came back then? That's strange because when I left England, London, there was a lot more music being played on a nightly basis in the pubs around Hammersmith and where I was living. And when I came home, home, the predominant music was show dance, you know, the dance. Of course I went to dances and things like that, but. I found out that there was a folk club being run in New More Ranges by a man called Jimmy Crowley. It used to be on a Tuesday night. And it changed my life dramatically because when I walked in there, there was this incredible music being played. Not just Irish traditional music, but folk music in general. And um, it was like an oasis you know, for me to be able to go and sit in such an intimate um, environment. and listen to the finest music and the finest musicians 
as close to him as you are to me. In those times, and you'd remember this, phones were very scarce. So the folk festival not just represented Irish traditional music, but general music of a live, of a live uh, discipline. And so if I wanted to book anybody, my job became more increasingly involved in the traditional side of it. And if we wanted somebody to play, we had to go down physically. I had to drive down physically and meet them in situ. People like Johnny O'Leary and um, uh, Mickey Duggan and um, Jimmy Dyer, all these people, it, you couldn't ring them. So you had to go down and meet them. And of course, in the consequence of that, we got to know them. And eventually they ended up as lifelong friends. And it was then, uh, I was sitting down one night in Dan Connell's on a Sunday night, waiting for Johnny O'Leary to have a break to see if he agreed to do the next folk festival. And uh, there was a woman there called Eileen Buckley. And uh, I'd never seen a set like dance, dance a set. And she picked me up and she threw me around the floor. And I didn't know what she'd done to me, but I liked it. And what it turned out to be was this Leo Luca set. But I, what struck me, uh, a couple of things that struck me when I walked into Dan Connell and saw the, um, the dancers, it wasn't ageist. Uh, there was people of several ages, two generations between them, dancing together. And in the traditional sense of dancing, it wasn't that stiff clone-like dancing. Women danced in a feminine way and men danced in a masculine way, very expressively, bang on time, hurting nobody and to me I thought how complete is that? Because it was it wasn't a performance, it was something that you do every day. And then I could see a living, breathing, vibrant tradition. And it changed my life. Each one of those stages changed my life in India. Today, Timmy lives happily near the Gaeltag village of Balyavurna, close to the Cork Kerry border. Things I hate negativity. Um, so I used to go down with three or four or five people and we'd learn a figure of a set every Sunday. And I'd bring that up the next Wednesday, I'd teach it in Cork. Learn the next bit of the set and through the course of which they became family with the people, you know. And, um, and then what happened is uh, people asked me what I teach sets and you know how the whole thing evolved now. I travel the world teaching the dances that I got from this region, you know. The Sleeve Lucre style is a unique style. It's a style that coincides with the music. It's a style where every movement of the body as well as the feet are in harmony with the rhythm and time of the music. Uh, the music of Sleep Locro was specially designed for dancing. It had the time and the rhythm and the pace. What I love about the dance, the, the reason, reason why I love, um, like I don't take much interest in the reels and stuff like that. They belong to a different tradition, north of the Shannon. Is there such a, a sense of um, life in a polka and in the slides? You know, there's, there's, there's. I hate to say it, but there's balls in the music. You know, and um, and I just could take it somewhere else. And the other thing too. Um, nowadays, I don't teach popular dances, not because I want to be different, but they're safe. They're safe as houses. They're in the pantheon of dances now. But there's a tremendous amount of completely different sets that exist around here that are not really in the pantheon. And if they're not minded, they'll die. You know, so I focused all my attention. Most of the sets I teach out now, the sets when I met were dead. And uh, the Jenny Ling, for example, um, the Meal of Jeep, the Ball and Polka, and I've got these all up of people in situ. So you know, when you get to respect people like that and they respect you back, it goes beyond respect, it goes into friendship and they're friends of mine for life. Timmy Crowley from Argoon and Mary, he's dead now. But they're, they're, 
Mary Louise from Kenya, I, uh, Bridie McCarthy. There's so many great people around here that have held on and are proud of their local sets. You know, not arrogant about them, but proud enough to retain them. And there's such a diversity of those sets around here that uh, it's taken me a lifetime and I don't know them all yet. So I'm content with that rather than going out and doing industrial dancing. And uh, so it's kind of a bit of a rebellion in a way, you know, but to keep our own sets alive. So there's a walk almost three, August Cockle Greener, you know, and there's life in those sets you couldn't believe. I think you'd have to be made of stone not to, not to absorb or appreciate that, you know. And so like I kind of say to myself, like, you know, 67 years of age, that's as good as it can get, but it always gets better. I've always um, avoided being authoritative in my teaching. I try and teach from a perspective of the fun, the crack, as well as the discipline and movement that's required. And I have a whole philosophy about sets that you can read figures, right hand in, left hand to the opposite, swing freight bows. You can read them and you can write them. But the one thing you cannot write or read is style. And style can't be taught. It has to be absorbed, like an osmosis. Because I'm very anxious about what Dan Connell gave to me, be retained. Young people don't have the rhythm today. The way we learned it in our time was, we'd give them a little tune like this, and it was, dance up, Paul K, one, two, three, dance up, Paul K, now for me, tip with the heel and tip with the toe. That's the way the whole care Oh! Oh, that's the rhythm. That's how we thought he, uh, the young people how to dance when we had music. And gave them the rhythm. Because if you're 20 and you've got an 80 year old couple dancing in front of you, are you going to push them out of the way just because it says in the book? You dance according to them because what you might have in vigour, they would have in grace. So you dance according to the other people. And then you've got that flow then, you know, rather than somebody saying, I'm a good dancer and you're, you're not up to my standard. That's not where it comes from. It never has. And uh, Dan gave me that. Funny enough, he had a very simple rule about dancing. And it's what wasn't said is implied. Listen by to see, you know, all the books are coming out the time. These are the only things you have to do when you're set dancing. Stay in front of the people behind you. Behind the people in front of you. Opposite the people opposite you and do it on time. Says it all, doesn't it? What I'd like to be remembered for is being, um, being true to what was given to me. Because where, 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 wherever I am, wherever I'm dancing, whenever I'm teaching, because it was such a hands-on learning process, I come to certain points in a, 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 in a dance that I'm teaching. And of course, people are a bit tired because they wouldn't be, to give them a break, I'd be giving them little anecdotal things that that particular figure would remind me. So, so all the time I'm teaching, it's like having them around me. And I mean that, it's like having them around me. And, uh, so if you were to ask me what the legacy would be, it was to pass on Dan, Dan Connor and Dan Keefe's and Pat Keen's legacy. That, like, uh, like, as I say, I live in privilege that I was lucky enough to be involved at the time. And it's the passing on, the handing on and holding true to as best you can uh, to what they gave, you know, in their minds, in their hearts and in their body and everything like that. And that to me is more than enough, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm.